Well, folks, would you uh, turn with me in your Bibles or on your devices, turn to John chapter 21. If you're using the, the, the Church Pew Bibles, it's uh, 1090, page 1090. Uh, we're turning to John 21 and reading from verse 15. So when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. Amen. We know this to be true. Let me pray. Holy Spirit, we ask you to speak to us as we consider your word. We ask that you would show us Jesus and make him beautiful to us. Let us hear this morning more than the words of a man in a pulpit, but let us hear Jesus as he speaks to each of us in his grace. Amen. Amen. I was watching a, a program on TV uh, late one evening last week. Uh, the program was called 24 Hours in Police Custody. I don't know if you watch it. I, I initially had turned it on for something in, in, in the background um, while Louise and I sat, but I became enthralled with what I was watching. Essentially, uh, two girls, two young girls, had set up what's called a honey trap. Uh, they had lured a young man uh, back to their apartment where they had arranged with two uh, other men who would come and were going to rob him uh, for his watch. He had a very expensive Rolex watch. Uh, and something went tragically wrong in, in the robbery and the young man ended up being stabbed and he sadly died at the scene. And uh, the program was the first 24 hours of trying to gather evidence for this. And the two girls were the first to be uh, arrested. And within 24 hours, the police had enough evidence to charge them both with murder. And amazingly, the TV program was able to show us this intimate phone call that one of the girls made to her mum after she had been charged with with murder. And this girl was the younger of the two girls. She seemed to be the more naive and the less malicious of the two. She was a third year university student and a lot younger than the other, the other girl that was arrested. And I was watching and it was at this stage that the reality of her situation hit her. And she had realized just how badly things had gone wrong, the severity of her actions, and how drastically her life was going to change. And she broke down on the phone and she sobbed to her mum and she said, this can't be my life. This can't be my life. And I realised as I was watching it, I was really sad for her. And the consequences of her actions, the events of these deeply regrettable few minutes were now the determining factor of how the rest of her life was going to be. And she sobbed in desperation because she had ruined her life. I want to ask this morning, as we come to look at Peter, is there something from your past that weighs you down? 
We're, we're, we're uh, looking at the disciple, Simon Peter, this morning. Uh, we're almost at the end of this Encounters with Jesus series. Uh, this is the last encounter from John's Gospel we're going to, to look at. Uh, and if anybody had reason to think that they had made a real mess of things, it was Peter, the disciple. Uh, a brief CV of Peter shows us that, uh, as I was saying to the children, Peter was the one with all the potential. At least he might have thought so. The gospel accounts show us time and time again how Peter stood out amongst the other disciples. He was kind of like the spokesman uh, and seemed to enjoy a slight precedence, uh, being one of Jesus' inner circle along with James and John. Peter was the one who was quick to speak and often had the right answers. Uh, and he would proclaim loyalty and commitment to Jesus that far out shone any, anyone else's. And he would declare to the group, and he did declare to the group, I don't care what everyone else does, Jesus. I'm with you, even if it means death. And a few well-known examples of Peter boasting about this. Jesus was asking, who do the people say that I am? And the disciples said, well, well, some say, Jesus, you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah or one of the great prophets. And it was Peter who made the audacious statement, I say you're the Messiah. I say you're the Holy One of God. It was Peter who said that. Jesus was teaching his disciples that the Son of Man must be handed over and killed and raised on the third day. And it was Jesus who took Peter to one side and said, Jesus, I will never let this happen to you. And it was when Jesus was being arrested, it was Peter who, who drew the sword and turned to violence to try and stop it from happening. When Jesus was walking towards the disciples on water, it was Peter who got out of the boat and walked on water himself. For, for, for a brief period before sinking. And when people were leaving Jesus in their droves because his teaching was too challenging, and Jesus said to the disciples, are you going to leave as well? It was Peter who said, Lord, to whom could we go? You are the one with the words of eternal life. To whom else could we go? We have believed that you are the Holy One of God. If there was a hierarchy of disciples... Peter was the head boy. He was the one with all the potential. He was the one whose heart was ablaze for the glory of Jesus and the one with the bright future ahead of him. Now, we, we, we've just passed Easter and we know that when Jesus was speaking at the Last Supper and he was telling his disciples that he was going to leave, I'm going to leave you now and you can't follow, it was Peter who says, Lord, where are you going? Why can't we follow you? And he said to Jesus, I will lay down my life to follow you. He says, whether it's going to prison or whether it's going to my death, Jesus, I am going with you. And he says, if everyone else abandons you, Jesus, even if it's just me and you left, I am with you. You can count on me, Jesus, he says. And we know that Jesus then said, uh, will you really, Peter? Because I tell you that before the morning comes, Peter, you're going to have denied me three times. And this is incredulous to him. He says there's absolutely zero chance of that happening. And in Mark 14, Peter says, even if I have to die, I will never disown you. But we know the story. Lisa read it to us on, on Good Friday uh, evening. Uh, Peter turned out to be all mouth, no trousers. When, when Jesus was being slapped and punched before him, when the soldiers were literally spitting into Jesus' face, Peter is asked, aren't you one of his followers? He says, I have no idea who that man is. Aren't you one of his followers? I, I've, I've never followed that guy a day in, in my life. Are you sure? Because you look like one of his followers. He says, I'm telling you, I have no idea who that is. And on the third time he did that, we read, 
publicly denying Jesus, we read that on the third time he makes eye contact with Jesus. Jesus and him look at each other and Peter leaves and he wept bitterly. And now Peter has to live with that. He has to live with that huge failure. He has to relive that gaze from Jesus every day of his his life. Warren Buffett, the famous investor, said, it takes 20 years to build a reputation and just five minutes to ruin it. And what a fall from grace we see in Peter. What a mess he has made of his reputation. So can I ask you again, is there an event in your life? Is there a personal or a moral or an ethical failure that haunts you this morning? Or is there a whole chapter of your life? Did you used to be someone or did you used to do some things that when you bring them into the light this morning, when they're recalled to your memory, they extinguish your flame? Or they dampen your your passion for the present. And maybe you're a Christian this morning, but you feel that your past disqualifies you from walking in the full victory of that. Or maybe you're not a Christian because you think your past makes that impossible. Maybe you're watching online this morning because you love Jesus, but you don't feel that you're good enough to be here. And you're like that quote from E. E. Scott, most times I am a museum of things I want to forget. Well, I'm going to invite you to think about this. It's very likely that Peter influenced the content of the Gospels. It's very likely that Peter was a consultant to the authors based on his experiences with, with Jesus. And he shared information with them and he, he filled in the, the details of, of these events to be written down and recorded. Or, or, or at the very least, if that's not the case, at the very least, Peter became highly influential in the early church. And he would have had sway over what was passed down to the generations of the churches and what was left out. And yet Peter's Failure is recorded. His fall from grace is documented for us in high definition. Right down to the detail of Peter making eye contact with Jesus on his third denial and him weeping. And and I want you to think, why would he do that? Because if it was us, and if we had the ability, would we not leave this out? You know, if we had editorial authority, would we not Photoshop some of this embarrassment out and maybe give ourselves a bit more credit or try to mitigate some of the damage to our reputation? And we might say, well, if not for ourselves, I mean, maybe we should do it for the sake of the gospel. Why would the Apostle Peter determine to have his most embarrassing moment of failure broadcast everywhere the church of Jesus Christ meets for all of its history? And the answer is, I think, because the gospel is transformative. Because Jesus restores our mistakes. Because the gospel says we are not the worth of our reputation We are not defined by our falls from grace. We are defined by grace. We are defined by his grace, the grace of Jesus. I wonder if you've ever had an awkward conversation with someone. You've had to to sit down and you've had to be engaged in a conversation that both parties would rather not have. A conversation where the unadulterated truth is laid bare and it has to be addressed regardless of how embarrassing or painful it's going to be. If you have been in a conversation like that, you'll know that that stings. But you'll also know that those conversations can be where all the growth happens. 
We read in, 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 this, in this text that Jesus appears to his disciples in John 21 on the beach. This is his third appearance. We read that they have breakfast from the fish that they catch. And after they've eaten, eaten it's, it's, it's time for Jesus and Peter to have an awkward conversation. The, the, the need to talk about what happened. The need to talk about that meeting of eyes as, 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 as Peter denied him. And can I say to you this morning, by the way, don't, don't shy away from the awkward conversation you have to have with Jesus this morning. It might be uncomfortable, but nothing but good comes from being vulnerable with Jesus. So they have this conversation. And when we read this exchange about, do you love me? We lose the impact when we read it in English. And I'm not a Greek scholar, by the way, but I know that when we read this in English, we don't get its full thrust. Because we have one word for love. And we use it in many different contexts. I love my wife, but I also love Hawaiian pizza. I love my children, and I also love their bedtime. The, 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 the word is, is used uh, in two different contexts. And, and in this exchange, there are two different Greek words used interchangeably throughout this exchange. There is the word agape, which is the highest form of love. It's used to describe God's love for us. It's divine, perfect, selfless love. When we read that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, we read God agape the world. When we read God is love, we read God is agape. It's perfect, highest form of love. And then another word is phileo, which means how, how we love e each other. And we might want to understand that as the highest form of love of which we're capable. It can be flawed. It can be conditional. So the two words used in this exchange are perfect love and flawed love. So let me read the exchange for you, putting those words in. Jesus asked, do you love me more than the others with perfect love? Peter replies, yes, Lord, you know that I love you with a flawed love. Jesus asks again, do you love me with perfect love? And Peter replies, yes, Lord, you know that I love you with a flawed love. Jesus asks, do you love me with a flawed love? And Peter replies, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you with a flawed love. It's an interesting exchange when we, when we see what's going on. And all you, you notice that all the big claims from, from Peter are gone. None of these claims about loving him with a perfect love and more than any of the others... There's just Peter's honesty of a flawed heart. When I applied for ministry training all those years ago, there's a question on the form. It's still on the form. And the question begins like this. So far as you know your own heart. The question is, so far as you know your own heart, have you felt the need of a personal saviour? And have you been persuaded and enabled by God's Spirit to embrace Christ as he's offered in the gospel? So far as you know your own heart, it's an interesting phrase um, because I find my heart to be very fickle and extremely unreliable. How often have I sang or or prayed in church about how much I love God to have my heart captured by something or someone else later that afternoon? And how often have I loved God in my spirit, but in the weakness of my flesh have I been lured to love something more? And how often have I sat in the frustration of repentance that my heart is wandering 
and my heart is roaming. So as far as I know, my own heart isn't describing an awful lot of knowledge. I don't think I know my heart very well. As far as I know my own heart, the scriptures are accurate when they say that the heart is deceitful. And above all things beyond cure, who can understand it, the Bible says. And I think Peter knows this all too well. You see in this exchange that the big, bold claims of Peter are now completely gone. Uh, he used to say, Lord, I love you more than all the rest of these disciples. Lord, Lord, Lord there's nothing my love for you uh, won't, won't, won't do. I'll go to prison, Lord. I'll go to the grave with you because I, I, I will never betray my, my love for you. But when it came to it, Peter loved his safety. Peter loved his freedom. Peter loved his life more than he loved the Lord Jesus. And so in the honesty of this awkward conversation, he says, Lord, you know my heart. The same way, Lord, that you knew my heart well enough to know that I would deny you when it came to the crunch. Lord, you know my heart. So look beneath the surface and you'll see, Jesus, that I do love you. But my heart is full of leaks. My heart is, 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 is flawed and my love for you is flawed. And, and if last week we saw Thomas who would say, Lord, I believe, help me with my unbelief. This week we see Peter saying, Lord, I love you, but would you help me when I don't? So can I encourage you this morning? Can I encourage you to approach Jesus with this type of honesty? Lord Jesus, I love you, but my love is flawed. Would you help me love you more than I do? Lord Jesus, I love you, but would you help me to love you more than the other things that can capture my heart? Okay, so they've had a, a, an awkward conversation about that. And Peter's obviously a lot more humble, and he's a lot more honest with his capabilities about loving Jesus. But I want us to see here that three times Peter denied Jesus. And then three times Jesus gives Peter the opportunity to proclaim his love for him again. And it's done in front of the rest of the disciples. And we might think that's a bit cruel. Surely this could have been done in private. But what we see here is Peter is publicly restored. He says, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. And the disciples see this. And they also see that Peter's not only forgiven, but that Jesus restores him. He's not just forgiven, he's restored. Jesus doesn't say, okay, Peter, you love me, that's fine. I forgive you. Now, now, now go and sit at the back and be grateful that I, I keep you around. Doesn't say that. He doesn't say, okay, Peter, that's that sorted. I'm glad we had that conversation. I forgive you. Now, 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 now just keep your head down and don't do anything else stupid. That's not the story here. That's not Peter's story. Uh, the, the, the Peter's story is the gospel story, and the gospel story is of complete restoration. Jesus places Peter back into the position of leadership, back into the position of usefulness and, and service. Jesus says three times, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep. Those are all instructions from Jesus that place Peter back into the role of usefulness. Friends, can we see here this morning that Peter hasn't blotted his copybook, as we might say. He hasn't burnt his bridges. He hasn't blown his chance. But with a new humility and a deep understanding of his weakness, Peter is publicly restored and reinstated to service in the kingdom of God. 
He's not damaged goods. He's not a lost cause because of Jesus and his grace. And he's powerful in service to God. So folks, let me finish by assuring you. I assure you this morning and I assure you if you're watching online, despite your past, and despite what haunts you from yesteryear, and despite what you think disqualifies you, or despite what others might say about you, despite what others might tell you, despite what the devil might whisper into your heart this morning, despite the mistakes you've made, despite the mistakes you're going to make, can I assure you that with Jesus is forgiveness and restoration and his mercies are new each morning. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, would you search our hearts and see, see that we love you, but our hearts are leaky. We love you, Lord Jesus, but our love is weak. We love you. Would you help us to love you more fully? Lord Jesus, we thank you that our pasts are forgotten. And Lord, that we're not defined by our faults from grace, but we're defined by the grace that you pour out upon us. What love could remember no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, you count not their sum. They're thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, Lord, are many, but your mercy is more. So forgive us for our feelings. Increase our love for you. And Lord, restore us to the areas of service and usefulness for the extension of your kingdom and the glory of Christ's name in which we pray. Amen.